Good morning, and welcome to this first meeting of the Subcommittee on Planning, Dispositions, and Concessions. Uh, this is the 11th session of the New York City Council. I'm Council Member Ben Kalos, Chair of this committee. Uh, you can hit me on social media at Ben Kalos, and in that way, we actually often take mem questions from members of the press and the public. We are joined here today by uh, our members who were here on time, which we always like. Uh, Council Member Andy King, Council Member Rian Ruben Diaz Sr., Council Member Chaim Deutsch. We are also joined by the Chair of the uh, Land Use Committee, Raphael Salamanca. Although I have been a member of the Land Use Committee and another Land Use Subcommittee last term on uh, landmarks, uh, this is my first hearing as Chair of this Subcommittee, and I'm looking forward to exploring every aspect of this subcommittee's authority and oversight ability for planning, dispositions, and concessions. The projects before us today and those that will be before us this term contain proposals for affordable housing. As we all know, affordable housing remains out of reach for far too many New Yorkers. As the administration continues to announce progress on preserving and building new housing, we in this committee will watch every deal closely to ensure New Yorkers are actually getting the affordable housing we need for the financial incentives that we provide. I plan to ensure every hard-earned tax dollar is maximized to drive a hard bargain and generate significantly more affordable housing. I also plan to ensure that this committee empowers communities and council members in the planning process, creates opportunities for minority and women-owned small businesses, creates good jobs in construction and service in these new buildings, and produces a full return on any city land and resources that we provide. Today we'll be holding two public hearings. The first hearing will be on 425 Grand Concourse rezoning and tax exemption applications, L land use items 8 through 10, and pre-considered land use items. The second hearing will be on land use al item 11, then 9 Fort Washington Avenue, cluster, UDAP, and tax exemption application. For those watching at home, uh, and as a caution to committee me members, I am going to want to try to explain all of this in plain language to folks because even those of us who are sophisticated might have trouble following along. Uh, LU is shorthand for land use application. UDAP, U-D-A-A-P, is an acronym for Urban Development Action Area Project, a term for Article 16 of the General Municipal Law. The UDAP process allows the city to sell and site, uh, sell the site and provide tax incentives for a project which serves public purposes essential to the public interest. The 425 Grand Concourse rezoning for property located in the Bronx and Land Use Chair Salamanca's district is submitted by HPD and includes the following actions. The first, an Urban Development Action Area Project, UDAP, designation, project approval and disposition of city-owned property. The second, a zoning map amendment to rezone a C4-4 district to a C6-3 district. Uh, the C stands for commercial, the uh, four relates to the amount of uh, density, and then the third uh, provides additional information as a subset within that uh, use and density category. The third, a zoning text amendment to introduce uh, R9-1 slash MIH regulations governing heights and setbacks to change the C C6-3 residential equivalent from an R9 uh, to an R9-1 in Bronx Community District 1 and to modify Appendix F to map the project area as a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing option 1. Uh, the R stands for residential, 9 stands for the amount of density, and the 1 shows that it's a modification from the initial residential 9 density. Uh, residential districts max out at an R10 or residential district of 10. Uh, the fourth item is a tax exemption pursuant to Article 11 of the Private ha Housing Finance Law. These actions will facilitate the redevelopment of a school, uh, the Castle on the Hill, 
that uh, many elected officials have graduated from, including a Congress member and I believe the Bronx Borough President, PS31, into a 27-story mixed-use building in which 100% of the apartments will be affordable. Taken together, these actions would have the effect of increasing the allowable residential floor area ratio from four to nine, where mandatory inclusionary housing is provided. Uh, and so the floor area ratio is just how many times you can layer development one on top of the other. So in this case, you could build four stories on an entire lot. And uh, under the new zoning, you could build nine stories on the lot if you were to cover it completely. In this case, you're not actually covering the whole lot, so you end up being able to stack it a lot higher. Uh, instead of using sky exposure planes, uh, the actions would impose a maximum base height of 125 feet and a maximum building height of 285 feet for developments using mandatory inclusionary housing program. Uh, and so typically, uh, you have a diagonal that you draw from the street uh, that determines how far the building can go tall, and uh, usually you can't pierce that sky exposure plane. Uh, and in this case, they just have to make sure the building follows certain height and setback requirements. Under mandatory inclusionary housing option one, at least 25% of the residential floor area must be provided as housing that is permanently affordable to households at an average of 60% of the income index. In this case, we usually call it the area median income or AMI. And at least 10% of the residential floor area must be provided as housing affordable to households at an average of 40% of the area median income. I am now opening up the public hearing on the 425 Grand Concourse Rezoning and Tax Exemption. And uh, with that, I'd like to call up uh, Jordan Press of HPD, Ted Weinstein of HPD, Christopher Stump of Trinity Financial, Thomas Brown of 425 Grand Concourse, and uh, Derek Lovett of MBD Community Housing uh, Corp. Uh, if you could <coughs> all take turns in stating your names for the record, and then I will uh, read you the affirmation. Good afternoon. I'm Jordan Press, Executive Director for Development and Planning at HPD. Hello, I'm Thomas Brown. I'm Vice President of Development with uh, Trinity Financial. Christoph Stump, Vice President of Design and Construction at Trinity Financial. Derek Lover, President and CEO of MBD Community Housing Corp. Uh, Ted Weinstein, HPD, Director of Bronx Planning. Do all of you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee and in response to all council member questions? Yes, I do. do. Let the record reflect that all said yes. Uh, the first speaker. Uh, if the first speaker would like to begin. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, congratulations on your uh, appointment to this role. Look forward to working with you uh, in the coming years. Land use numbers 8, 9, and 10, and, pre and the pre-considered item are related to a proposed ULERT project known as 425 Grand Concourse in the Mott Haven section of the Bronx. The site has been occupied by Public School 31, a landmark collegiate Gothic building constructed in the late 19th century. The school closed in 1997 and the building was demolished in the summer of 2015 following the issuance of a full vacate order by the Department of Buildings due to severe structural damage that was exacerbated by Superstorm Sandy. I'd like to add that the department recognizes just how special this site is to Bronx sites and to the thousands of students who came through its halls. In 2015, HPD issued a request for proposal for the purpose of redeveloping the site as a mixed-use affordable housing project. Subsequently, a sponsor was selected, who I'm sitting with here today, Trinity Financial and MBD, uh, to build out the project under HPD's mix and match program. Currently, there are four land use actions before the planning subcommittee. Land use number eight seeks the designation as an urban development action area, as well as disposition and project approval for the vacant city-owned site located at Block 2346, Lot 1 in Bronx Council District 17. Land use number nine seeks to change from a C4-4 district to a C6-3 district. 
The residential equivalent of a C6-3 zoning district is an R9-1 zoning district for MIH developments. A C6-3 district will permit a maximum residential FAR of 7.52, the maximum commercial FAR of 6.0, and the maximum community facility FAR of 10.0. Land use number 10 seeks to amend the zoning resolution by modifying bulk reg regulations in a residential district rel relative to mixed use buildings in commercial districts and other regulations in order to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area under option one. The proposed project HPD will dispose, dispose of as a city owned site, will dispose of it to the sponsor who plans to construct one 27 story mixed use residential building in total, there will be 277 rental units, including a superintendent's apartment, as well as community and commercial spaces. Under option one of MIH, at least 69 units will be permanently affordable, and with an additional 15% as required by HPD's term sheets, a total of 111 units will be permanently affordable. The residential portion of the project will include a mixture of unit types, including 45 studios, 92 one-bedrooms, 94 two-bedrooms, and 46 three-bedroom apartments. The anticipated rents will range from 30% to 100% of AMI, which are, are equivalent to approximately $318 to $1,364 for studios, to $572 up to $2,384 for three bedroom apartments, which will all be distributed throughout the building. The project will be constructed to meet passive house standards, and amenities of the building will include a laundry room on each residential floor, and a community room with direct access to the 23rd floor to landscape roof terrace and a green roof. The project will also provide 41,625 square feet of community facility space that will include educational space, a medical center, and cultural center. The developer is committed to working with the Parks Department in the rebuilding of the adjoining garrison playground, including providing space for a comfort station and rebuilding the walkway adjoining the park like to extend our thanks uh, especially to the councilman and the borough president for their allocation of res OA to help redevelop that playground. The tenant of the commercial space is anticipated to be a supermarket. The pre-considered land use item seeks article 11 tax benefits for the project in order to facilitate continued affordability of the residential units. The term will be for a period of 40 years coinciding with the regulatory agreement. Therefore, HBD is before the subcommittee seeking approval of the pre-considered item as well as land use items number eight, nine, and 10. And I'd now like to turn it over to the project sponsor to uh, go more in depth about the project's design, uh, affordability, amenities, uh, and a little bit about their history. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, before we talk about design, I just wanna briefly just describe the uh, development team. Uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, Trinity Financial and uh, MBD Community Housing Corp will be uh, the co-developers on the project. The architect will be Datna Architects. The general contractor on the project will be Manadna Construction. And uh, the management company, uh, we're still in conversations to uh, determine who that will be. Um, uh, project. My name is Christoph Stump with Trinity Financial. Thanks again, uh, council members, for having us here. Um, a project that Trinity Financial has uh, completed recently in the Bronx includes uh, this mixed uh, income, mixed uh, use residential project in the South Bronx uh, on Cortland and 161st Street. Um, this project here um, was mentioned uh, is a, 30, uh, a 27 story proposed development uh, with approximately 312,000 square feet of space. Um, the um, 270 units in uh, the building uh, will start from the fourth floor up and then <coughs> we have a uh, roster of mixed, uh, com mixed com non-residential components on the first three floors that I'll go into more detail. Um, the expected construction start is after July 2018 and it's going to be uh, likely a 30 month uh, construction process. Um, the total development cost is uh, approximately $160 million with um, approximately 105 million uh, construction cost. Um, I'm not going to repeat the ULORP actions. Uh, the redesigned features, um, this building is a passive house, is going to be one of the largest passive houses in uh, uh, the United States. 
Um, a passive house is a building concept that uh, greatly reduces the building's energy consumption and carbon uh, dioxide output um, approximately up to 70% uh, compared to a standard new construction building. Um, this is a view of um, the proposed building, um, a view to the southeast um, showing the surrounding, the, the very heterogeneous surroundings of the project site and um, a, an adjoining park, garrison park, that's directly to the north, it's so it's slightly to the left of the building. Um, the project is located uh, on East 144th Street and Grand Concourse in very close proximity to uh, the two, four, and five train stations on 149th Street and Grand Concourse. Um, surroundings also uh, host this community college and a number of um, other uses, non-residential uses. Um, the majority of the um, entrances of the buildings are located in, uh, on Grand Concourse, including the residential entrance. Uh, retail is uh, wrapping around, uh, starting on the southeast corner of, of Grand Concourse and East 144th Street, and educational uh, entrances on Walton Avenue. The building. Uh, has uh, all the non-residential uses represented on the ground floor, here represented in different colors. Um, the second and third floor are entirely uh, um, dedicated to the educational use and the residential use starts at the fourth floor um, with a, a residential terrace on the fourth floor um, and then um, several other uh, uh, uses going up, uh, amenities going up. The um, general floor plan is very simple, a double loaded corridor with a, uh, a south facing window in the corridor and a mix of uh, studios, one, two and three bedrooms on each floor. Um, all apartments will uh, adhere to the HPD design guidelines. Uh, important to point out is the activity that this uh, project uh, is trying to achieve on the ground floor level. Um, all uses are uh, designed to uh, activate um, the ground floor. We have uh, a proposed uh, a supermarket use, a medical facility, a cultural facility, an educational facility, and uh, in conjunction with the residential, uh, we expect uh, uh, activation throughout the day and throughout uh, the days uh, of the week. Uh, important to note is uh, our interface with Garrison Park to the north. The lower portion of uh, the slide shows um, uh, the southern edge of the park uh, that uh, shows a walkway, a connecting walkway on this very long north-south stretching superblock, uh, approximately <laughs> at the height of 146th Street. Um, that is part of this project. Um, artifacts that were uh, recovered from the, the PS31 demolition will be shown along this walkway um, and, and be um, visually accessible for the public. Uh, on a separate, uh, a separate project that's uh, going on concurrently is the um, redesign and renovation of Garrison Park. Um, that I'm not going to go into great detail here, but uh, there's a var variety of uses um, proposed uh, an evening rendering of the project that shows our vision how this um, project is going to activate and also secure the area. Um, I mentioned that this uh, project is special because it is a passive house. It also contains a um, what is called a black start gas fired uh, ge emergency generator that can add uh, additional loads uh, to to the standard uh, fire and safety loads, uh, which include um, loads that will make this building resilient and um, independent of a po in, in case of a power outage, and people will be able to um, shelter in place during a prolonged pow power outage. Uh, to briefly describe the uh, project's affordability, 10% uh, of the project will be affordable at 30% uh, AMI, 10% will be affordable at 40%, 30% at of the building will be at 60% AMI, 25% will be at 80% AMI, and, uh, and another 25% will be affordable at 100% AMI. Uh, so this brief presentation just wanted to uh, 
represent and, and describe to you some of the our project and uh, show you some of the benefits that we feel uh, will uh, be given to the community. Uh, one being much needed mixed income housing. Another would be uh, active, vibrant ground floor uses through our retail, our educational, our cultural, and our medical uses, which are on the ground floor. Uh, as a company, we embrace and make a commitment to uh, MWB and local participation within the project. And uh, as described, we feel that uh, the passive house elements as well as the other design elements make this a very distinctive project. So uh, thank you all for your time. and. Uh, I guess we're open for questions. If you have I will uh, turn it to our uh, land use chair as a courtesy, since not only is he the land use chair, but this is also a project in his district, which he may wish to make remarks about or just jump into questions. Thank you, Chair Kalos. Uh, good uh, sorry, one second. I did not. I wanted to just acknowledge that we've been joined by Councilmember Gibson and Councilmember uh, Levine. Sorry for the interruption. That's right. Thank you, Chair Kalos. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, so, you know, we've been working on this project for some time now. Um, Trinity is, uh, you know, we're, it's, we're, we're, I just met you guys not too long ago, a few months ago, but it's good to see that uh, you're working with a credible not-for-profit in my community, which is Mid-Bronx Desperados, and so that was very rewarding. Um, I, uh, I have many details on this project. Again, we've met many times, but I would like to uh, put certain things on the record. Um, first, in terms of your educational facility, have you identified uh, a school, and how much space are, or do you have available for this educational facility? Uh, the educational facility will be uh, approximately 36,000 square feet, and we're in discussions with a number of operators, educational uh, charter school operators uh, for that space. Um, uh, how many how many um, children do you anticipate that that space will hold? Or how many seats? Better yet, that is uh, different and uh, depending on the operator uh, with their program. Okay. All right. Um, in terms of the AMIs, um, I know that we I, we we changed the formula around. Um, you know, my in my district, I uh, I'm more into mixed income, ensuring that my low income families have access to these units. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also understand that we have working class families uh, in, in in my district. Um, can you uh, can you explain a little bit in terms of the breakdown and what support you will be giving uh, uh, the community in, in terms of preparing them uh, for the application process? Well, as part of our as part of our preparation and our marketing process, uh, we've uh, been in discussions with a number of stakeholders in the area, including your office, to uh, jointly look to work at, work out a housing fair and some and some uh, training and some workshops with the community to prepare them for the marketing process. Something that I've been doing with Manny Management, I think I saw Ismini here. Uh, we've had housing forums, and I think this is something that we can work with Mid Bronx Desperados. Um, and basically, uh, it's a year before the application process uh, or applications are going to be, you know, HPD is going to start accepting applications mm -hmm. through Housing Connect. Uh, you inform the community. Mm -hmm. uh, you educate them on how to properly fill out these applications, even though they're online. Um, and there's also a financial component, preparing individuals. Uh, you know, credit, I know, plays a, a major factor here. Um, in terms of local hiring, um, let, let's talk uh, about your construction jobs. How are you going to ensure that there's local hiring in the community? So we intend to hire a third-party uh, workforce uh, a consultant who will work closely with the community and with your office um, and with other uh, local stakeholders to ensure that we get qualified um, uh, uh, workforce that we can train and employ at, at the site. Have you hired that third party monitor? We're still looking and discussing the, the, uh, the, the consultant. Richard? Yeah, Eric Lovett, MBD Community Housing Corp. Um, MBD has worked with Mananak on two other very large projects. Uh, in our portfolio, we also have partnered with Mananak and Giffen Real Signature Urban Development on uh, West Farms Road. And we've been very successful to hold our workshops for 
uh, MWE and local hires that want to be a part of this, and they also have a mechanism of reaching out and uh, uh, reporting these. Uh, um, in terms of your uh, staffing and security, and I guess your maintenance staff, uh, will will they be unionized? Will you be working with labor in terms of your, after construction is completed, the permanent jobs that you'll have there? Mm -hmm. How many permanent jobs will you have, and will they be part of labor? Will you be working with a 32BJ or so on and so forth? Well, we, we've arranged uh, meetings with uh, several groups, in including 32BJ, to to talk about the operations of the building going forward. As of right now, we haven't made any commitments to any one group at all. All right, and you, you are committed to paying fair wages? Absolutely. With benefits? Yes. I'd just like to say that MBD has 32BJ as their, the union for their uh, employees and maintenance staff, and we have enjoyed a very productive relationship. Okay, all right, it's refreshing to hear. Um, what is um, MBD's role? How long will you will, will you be involved in this project? We'll be in involved with throughout the whole project. We're 50-50 uh, partners. We're you know in step. Um, we're uh, Trinity is, is clearly taking the lead to their expertise, but MBD has in the last uh, five years repositioned its total portfolio. We've 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 uh, rehabbed over a thousand units in place, so we have experience with development as well, and we'll be uh, adding whatever support we can. All right. And then my understanding, this project is part of the MIH process. And so I know that I, I heard, um, Jordan, you, you discussed what's the, how many units are going to be permanently affordable? And after how many years? So um, MIH is actually calculated based on, uh, on floor area rather than individual units, but the, um, the uh, uh, estimate that we have is that at least 69 will be permanently affordable <coughs> under MIH. And then the way that um, the mix and match term sheet works, which this project's being financed under, is if the developer is taking city subsidy on an MIH project, we require 15% additionally permanent. So, uh, which brings the total number to uh, approximately 111. The, the 69 units under MIH <coughs> need to conform with option one uh, at an average of 60% AMI. The remaining 15% is something that we work out um, as we get closer to closing. Um, there, there are always some unknowns between the time of land use approval and closing and cost can be impacted by which units are permanently affordable. All right. Now, this this project is 100% affordable yes. for how many years? So, 40% uh, of the units will be permanently affordable. Mm -hmm. The other 60% of units will be uh, subject to a regulatory agreement of 40 years. I'd also like to add that the way that HPD structures our financing, the loan that we provide, is that we, we effectively backload it so that uh, there is great incentive for the developer to come back to the city and refinance with us at the end of the 40-year term. Uh, in addition, um, because rents are restricted um, and uh, tax costs will become present at the end of 40 years, again, it is in the uh, owner's interest to come back to the city to try to re-up on that tax exemption, they can only do so if it meets the affordability goals of the city at that time. The one other thing I wanted to mention is all the units are rent stabilized. At the end of the 40-year term, for the 60% of units that aren't permanent, those tenants will be rent stabilized through their tenancy at a minimum. Okay. Um, and uh, so, you know, again, these are things that I, I was aware of, and I just wanted to make sure that they were on the record. Now, let's just have a kind of conversation about some of my concerns about this project. Number one, parking is not provided here. Um, I know that this is a, a transit-rich area on Grand Concourse on 149th Street, uh, but yet it's, uh, it's very difficult to find parking in that area. You have Hostos Community College. You have other, you know, so you have students and you have employees. You have other housing developments in the area. What is HPD doing um, in, in terms of trying to identify a parking location uh, for these um, for these uh, potential new tenants? 
So the and I'll I'll ask my co-panelists if they want to weigh in. But the um, the environmentals identify um, other parking lots in uh, within a is a quarter mile radius um, that have capacity. Um, in terms of on street parking, what we're happy to work with your office on is. Um, to go out with the Department of Transportation, I think we should walk around the site and the neighborhood, see if there are any opportunities to add on-street parking, um, which in our experience, um, despite um, your neighborhood, this neighborhood, like many other neighborhoods where people have the, the feeling of being parking strapped, right? What, what they're really looking for from what we've seen is free on-street parking, even if the, the lots where you would have to pay might have availability, which we know they do in the area. So I think, um, you know, certainly what we can commit to is uh, seeing if we can identify additional free on-street parking um, and happy to uh, discuss more just what the capacity is of the, the private lots in the area. All right. Well, I, I, I look forward to continuing that conversation in terms of parking. And then finally, something that in terms of your community benefit uh, package, Garrison Park. As you know, I have a commitment to that park, which is right next, you know, adjacent to the property. I actually allocated in uh, two budgets ago $1.5 million for my discretionary capital dollars. And so there was some request in terms of parks department, number one, that uh, there um, a comfort station be built there. Now, this comfort station, this bathroom, is going to be attached to your building, or you're going to be building a brand new comfort station in the park? It'll be connected to, it'll be a part of the building. Okay. And so now, my second thing is that there was a, uh, a request in terms of maintenance of the park. Um, I have your letter of support here, uh, well, I, I guess your letter of commitment, um, and you, um, you, you, you've you committed annually to $26,013 annually for the operating expense of, of, of the park, and you've also committed to an increase of 3% annually. Um, and um, something that is a deal breaker for me, and I know we've had side conversations, but I want to put this on the record. Um, in order for the parks, that particular park, to have full-time maintenance, the total cost is fifty-two thousand dollars a year, and so I am. Um, if 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 a parks department were to only get the twenty-six thousand thirteen dollars that you are offering a year, there will only be maintenance there from April through October, um, and I am because number one, you're not providing any parking. Um, you know, there, there, has, there has been certain things in which the community has accepted in terms of this project. I think that it's feasible uh, for, uh, for you to sit down with HPD and figure out how to provide that extra uh, 25000 a total of $50,000, uh, to have uh, full-time maintenance, 40 hours a week, 12, uh, 12 months out of the year. If, if I can just add, I want to uh, just correct one item. Um, so the, the commitment of... $26,013 would fund a, uh, a parks department employee for six months during the busiest times. On the other six months of the year, parks department would deploy a, a, a regular mobile crew that opens the park, closes the park, and provides kind of just general level of parks maintenance. It, during those other six months, you wouldn't have somebody there time no I'm, I'm full aware of that and the problem that I have with that process that Parks Department has is that they do not open and close my parks um, on time as they should they do not come and clean my parks so we're just adding another park to add to that schedule which will be basically ignored and so that is why um, I, I am res respectfully requesting that you, uh, you add another $25,000 to that community benefit package so that this park can have full-time maintenance and it can be maintained at all times. Yeah. Well, looking forward to continuing that conversation with you. Your, right. your interest is all right. Mr. Chair, needed. thank you. Uh, thank you, Land Use Chair Salmanca. As the prior chair to this committee, I believe you ran through many of the questions I had hoped, but uh, I'm sure there will be some uh, left for me to go through, but I appreciate your leadership this committee prior and uh, look forward to continuing our work together. 
So uh, I'm going to break up my questions into a couple of areas. Uh, first one is, what are the subsidies? Uh, second group of questions are, affordable for whom? It's a frequent refrain we hear from uh, the community. Uh, talking a little bit about the community facilities, and as I uh, mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, talking about uh, MWBE and uh, jobs. So first piece, uh, is there a tax abatement? How long is the tax abatement? How much is the annual tax abatement? And what is the value over the life of the abatement? There is a 40-year uh, uh, Article 11 tax benefit. The net present value uh, of the cumulative cost of this exemption to the city uh, is $22,726,925, or $82,000 per unit. And what is the cumulative uh, total if we do not assume net present? What is the uh, what would be the tax, if we were to receive the tax payments from the developer over 40 years, uh, how, what would be the cumulative value of those payments? We'd have to get back to you on that. Fair enough. Uh, ple please do so in, in writing so we can include it in the record. If I, I seem to feel like a $20 million net present value is likely $80 million or more. Would that be fair? I want to give you an accurate answer, so let me get back to you. Okay. Uh, so first off, we're doing $20 million at least. Next question, is HPD providing financing in this project? What is the interest rate? And what is paid by the developer on an annual basis? And uh, how much is the developer receiving from taxpayers through HPD? Um, OK, so I, I'd, I'd like to just say broadly, we're getting pretty deep into business terms of this deal yeah. um, that, um, that get negotiated uh, on an ongoing basis between this point in the process and the closing. Um, so uh, I am happy to discuss some of these items. Uh, other items I uh, would prefer to discuss uh, directly with the individual council members and, and certainly keep them updated between the time of the land use uh, committee's approval and uh, in consideration and closing. If, if, the if, on, if only this was, was an individual council member or all of our money it isn't, it's the taxpayers and this is their opportunity to make sure that the money's, uh, that they're getting a return on their investment. So this is something I'm interested in seeing for, for all deals, not just this one. So I guess what, what are the threshold ranges? Uh, so this, this pro to answer your, your original question, this project is being financed under our mix and match term sheet, which uh, you can find on our website, nyc.gov slash HPD, under developers and financing. Um, each unit, uh, depending on its AMI level, has, uh, d depending on its, the, the income restriction, has a different level of subsidy uh, per unit, uh, and that amount can change from where we're at today versus uh, the total amount that's needed at the time of closing. The reason for that change is because construction costs fluctuate, the amount of tax credit equity that's provided in, to the project can change, a uh, number of other uh, issues can change between now and the time of closing. And, and so I, w what is the maximum that the taxpayers uh, could or, or would pay on this project, or, or what is the current? Which, whichever one you feel more comfortable on. There, there is not a, so I, I would refer you back to the, to the term sheets, um, but, so, so but I, it, would, it would not be, particularly in this public forum, would not be appropriate for me to uh, commit to what the maximum amount that a taxpayer, that the taxpayer is, is committing to in this project. Okay, at so. This, at this point, at this point in the process. We are, we are at a point of land use approval. We are not at the point of approving business terms, which is conducted through a separate process. Fair enough. So I'm just looking at the mix and match term sheet. And so for 80% of AMI, which is 25% of the units, the maximum subsidy is 115,000. Would that be accurate? That's according, you have the term sheet. I would, yep. we, could, we can pass, pass along a copy for you, but that, that is the term sheet, so we'll, we'll Hopefully, put all that together, but uh, 
the, the subsidy goes up, so there's 10% uh, that the council member was able to negotiate that 30% of AMI and the subsidy for 20% 27% of AMI is 185,000. So, so uh, will w would you prepare a a list of the maximum financing for us so that we can share that with the public? So the guidelines for the financing is what is in the term sheet, which is publicly available on our website. Um, the what the actual number will be is not determined until closing. It is. It, it would it would not be genuine of me to discuss what that number is going to be at the time of closing at this point in the process. And so when we're talking about the hundred and fifteen thousand dollars subsidies for eighty percent of AMI units, that would be the that that's the maximum. And and is that a just we hand them the cash to the developer or is that a loan? It's provided it's provided as a loan that's deferred and accrued uh, and paid at the end of the loan term. Okay, so, and the loan term is either 30 or 40 years? That's correct. So folks get the $115,000 for every unit at up to, uh, and then they do not pay interest on that loan for 30 or 40 years, and then at that point, what interest rate are they usually going to be charged, and a range is fine at the, at the term conclusion of it? It's the applicable federal rate, which is approximately 2.6%. I would love to get a loan at that rate. Uh, the uh, next well, question. I mean, so I, I agree, and that that goes to the value of the city subsidy that is being provided, um, because to to make up for a gap of where the private market and private lenders are not providing it. And, and if in, in the breakdown of how much of the subsidy you'd give, if you could also share the difference between how much the carry cost is between the zero deferral that we're offering the developer and what it's costing the taxpayers to pay off that 2.6% interest, as well as what the difference is between that 2.6% interest and what the market would bear for a regular person like me or somebody watching at home or even somebody in the district if they wanted to borrow that. So if they're paying four, five, six, God knows how much percent, what the value of that differential is. And now, are you the only ones providing subsidies, sorry, financing from the government, or is another agency also providing financing? HTC, uh, Housing Development Corporation, which is um, which is our sister agency, which the HPD commissioner is also the chair of the board of, is also providing um, is also providing financing on the project. And, and uh, HD, would, are you comfortable uh, answering for HDC, or do we need to have HDC at these hearings as well in order? comment on their The financing. HDC financing is also subject to an HDC term sheet, which is available at nychdc.com. Fair enough. Um, we're just trying to make this easier for folks who are watching at home or want to pay attention so that they don't have to go to this website and then a second website and then look things up on a term sheet. The goal is to try to get everything out in front of folks. Uh, so hopefully we can get the value of that. Is there any additional financing on this project or is it all lending from the government? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, Thomas get into it, but we should also mention the tax credit, federal tax credits. Yeah. And go ahead. So as part of our package, and again, I'll, I'll preface that by saying that uh, our financing is still under negotiations with a number of parties uh, right now. But uh, as part of our projected package, uh, we're also looking at uh, low-income housing tax credits on, this, uh, on the project, uh, low-income housing tax credit equity, to be specific. And we're also looking at, uh, in accordance with the term sheets, uh, some level of developer equity, which is still under negotiation with the uh, city of New York as well. Uh, okay, so you're getting the federal tax credits, and then what was the last one? Uh, developer equity. And that's through which agency? Well, we, will be, we would be putting that into Got the it. project as part of the uh, mix and match. Okay. Uh, and so then the next piece is there's a, a rezoning as part of this. So uh, under the current development rights, uh, you can do that four floor area ratio. Under this new rezoning, you're going to be able to go up to nine. So how much additional square feet are you going to be getting, would you say? Well, that would be, with that calculation, it would be five times uh, the lot area, which is approximately 29,000 uh, uh, square feet. 
So, so about 145,000, give or correct. take. Correct. And so uh, what is the value uh, if you were to have to purchase those air rights in, in that community board or in, in the Bronx in order to uh, do that? Well, we'd have to, I, I, I want to stop short of uh, conveying numbers that we haven't uh, okay. analyzed. So I, I can't give you that right now. In, in terms of the rezoning, is that uh, being put forward by city planning or by HPD or which agency is suggesting the change in zoning? The purpose of the rezoning is actually to make this block um, more consistent with the surrounding area. Um, in 2009, city planning uh, sponsored a rezoning of the whole lower Grand Concourse area. They exempted this block, feeling it wasn't needed at the time. Um, so now um, it's not exactly the same zone as around it, but it's, it's very similar to the zoning around it. And it's done, you know, very truthfully to accommodate uh, sufficient affordable housing. Okay. Uh, wi who at the table feels comfortable with determining the value of air rights? Uh, in the community board and, and what the cash value is for these additional air rights. We'll have to get back to you on that. Fair enough. And, and so hopefully this will be something that we can share on the record with the public. You'll, you would have to discuss with council whether you want to reopen the hearing for that purpose. Uh, I, I, I would be, we would hope to add it just to the papers that we make available on the city council website. So, so yes. Uh, the next piece is how, how tall are the buildings in the vicinity? The, the, the immediate area, let's say a you know, block or two radius, um, has very, very little residential. Um, it's adjoining in addition to the park. Um, Host Coast Community College is up the block and across the street. Um, and those are you know, a few stories. Um, behind this to the west, is mostly manufacturing. That was the point of the rezoning, mm -hmm. was to make a manufacturing zone, a mixed use zone. Um, and so again, those are not very high. Um, about two blocks to the west and a little north, uh, there are two buildings currently in construction. Uh, they're not as tall as this would be. Uh, and so the wh what's the tallest building currently in construction in the vicinity? Um, in the teens, I forget the exact number of stories. And, and what is the maximum height and what is the likely build out for this building? Well, this building is going to be 27 stories, 285 feet, 285 feet. And, and so in MIHZQA, which is the rezoning the city just did, and in R10A, which is the densest possible, it actually has one additional floor area ratio. Uh, the height is 260 feet. Uh, is there a reason why additional 25 feet is necessary for your building form, even though you actually have 10% less density than the densest district in the city? Well, this is, it's a C63 with MIH, if, if I'm understanding your question right, and that's, that provides the, the height. There was, I, I, I'd have to say, and, 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 and I'm, I'm just a little hesitant to say, about saying too much because I don't want to be incorrect. This was an extremely complicated rezoning. Um, uh, Christophe here, who's an architect, has called it the most complicated rezoning he's, he's ever dealt with. Um, and there was a tremendous amount of back and forth between the development team and city planning as to how to make this work, how to make it make sense, mm -hmm. including in terms of just the language of the text. Um, they had just done a uh, new text to accommodate MIH, and they wanted to make sure that um, it was consistent, that, that that was being proposed here um, as a text amendment was consistent with what they were saying generally under MIH. And in fact, the draft language was was redrafted, you know, a few times. Um, and so it is, I mean, I can read from the ULARP application the two or three paragraphs that describes this, um, if, if that's helpful. But that's, it's, it's in the ULARP application itself as best as that. It doesn't compare um, what's going to have to here to an, an R10A. That comparison is not being made. Um, but it does explain why this is being done. Okay. 
uh, I, I was hoping for quicker back and forth on the questions and answers uh, for, for full public that disclosure. That's just a more complicated question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. For full public disclosure, we do try to give questions to folks ahead of time, so we would hope that uh, in, in the time between when we uh, gave the heads up and uh, now that folks could have uh, uh, prepared. Uh, I know that we have members uh, who have questions, so I'm going to just ask one line, more line of questioning and reserve on questioning about MWB and the jobs, which is just the affordability. So what is the household income in the surrounding neighborhood in the same zip code? The uh, median household income uh, in 2015 for Bronx Community Board 1 is $24,670. Uh, and what uh, what AMI does that translate to? Uh, probably in the thirty percent range. Okay. And then the next question is, what are the rents in the surrounding neighborhood in the same zip code? About a hundred percent of AMI. So you've got people making far there are people making far less than what the rents in the neighborhood cost. And in terms of the assessment of the uh, rents, is that based on market units or rent stabilized units? I'm sorry, the assessment of the rents? How, how did you come to the determination that the rent in the neighborhood was at 100% of the area median income and if you can share what those rates would be? Uh, there was a market analysis yeah, market done. Analysis, yeah. Yeah. A market study undertaken. And the market study included both the rent stabilized units, the rent controlled units, and the markets yes. and came to Yes. And so that included what people are already paying who aren't getting a new lease and people who are seeking a new lease. Yes. Okay. So I, I think it is it is pretty amazing that you have a, a champion in uh, our land use chair, Salmanca, that he was able to get uh, almost all of the units, 75% of them, to be under what the current rates are in the neighborhood. Uh, in other types of developments, I will be concerned if we are building units that are less affordable than the surrounding communities. So I just want to uh, praise him uh, for that. Uh, and I know he's asked a lot of the other questions around these areas. Mm -hmm. I'd like to uh, turn it to Council Member King. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, gentlemen, for mm -hmm. today's conversation. Informative, enlightening, and yes, there's more that has to be done mm -hmm. um, as we have these conversations. Uh, I understand not trying to get in front of too far in front of the process so we can get accurate answers to the best of our abilities at this time and moment. Mm -hmm. Council Member Salamanca, this is his district, so for the most part, members tend to defer to the member on what the member is advocating and negotiating for their district. Mm -hmm. But I do want to just ask one or two questions in regards to sim similar to what he was asking in regards to the layout. And I understand when you do build buildings such as these, mm -hmm. there needs to be a set of parking that's dedicated a percentage of parking. Since there is no parking, I'm very familiar with the neighborhood, worked in the neighborhood for over 15 years, so I know parking is a challenge. Even though it's part of a commercial strip, uh, warehouses and, you know, industrial, but still parking on the Grand Concourse and those back streets is really no. You got NYCHA developments, you have tenement buildings. What, you, you know, I didn't hear a real plan for parking, other than let's go take a look at it. So no one's decided early on that let's go take a look at that before we decided not to build any parking in this, include any parking in this structure? There, so I'm gonna, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, th this is in um, you know, what is referred to as a transit zone. Um, as, as you all know, the zoning resolution was amended, uh, I guess at this point two years ago on the ZQA. Um, and, and I would say from HPD's point of view, what we found over the years is that when new buildings were being built through our programs, which had parking, either garages or surface parking, they were almost always significantly underused. You know, we would walk in, and I personally would walk into some of these buildings, and, and I would see a, a garage with 20 spaces with two cars. Um, we would speak to developers uh, and managing companies, and they would say that that was pretty consistent. Um, and that you know, bluntly is just a, a waste of valuable, scarce resources of, of funds and of space. I mean, in fact, one of the phenomena that we've been experiencing in the last few years 
is uh, in many cases developers who built a building with a surface parking lot um, have come back to get funding to build a second building on part or all of that parking lot because it's just being so underutilized. Um, I mean, city planning had a whole series of other criteria and facts that they learned um, in putting together that amendment of the zoning resolution. Um, this is an excellent example of a, of a transit zone. It's literally just down the block from a subway station that serves three different subway lines. Um, it's, uh, there were buses, it's on the Grand Concourse, major thoroughfare in the Bronx, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, people drive around looking for spaces rather than go into garages very often. Um, you know, and that's one of the things that we've been told when we've spoken in front of community boards and other organizations. Um, and so, well, it, I, I don't think people doubt that there are, um, that there's uh, a challenge for on-street parking in, in areas. Um, it, it's not solved if you build a garage or a parking lot that then isn't used. And that was our experience. Okay, so in the future, as you continue to move with this project, please, um, it's up to Councilman Salamanca if he wants to figure out how to include mm. parking, even if it's just a, 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 a smidgen of parking, because it's what's going to end up happening is going to become a DOT mm. problem for the residents who will get tickets, and they're going to be mad because if I want, if I do own a car and I and I should be able to park in a building such as it, not mm. ride around for hours trying to park a spot, or got to get moved because alternate side of street parking and get tickets. So I'm not saying you got to build. 50, 50 spaces, but you got to figure out how to provide something <coughs> for your new building. So if anybody wants that option, at least there's something there available. Yes. My second question would be, we are talking about the height of the building around, you know, like again, the buildings around there are not this high, 27 stories. I just want to know what was, how did you come to the decision why 27, not 23, not 12? Because other than the NYCHA buildings, there aren't buildings that big in this location. Okay, well first I'll just, uh, I'll talk about the intent here and then they can talk about the actual technical aspects of it. Um, when, unfortunately, the school building had to be demolished, um, making this uh, a city-owned vacant lot, um, and we determined it would be a good site to build new affordable housing, um, we made a decision, and, and I spoke to um, the community board about this and others, that this should be something a little different. Um, I even said that when I spoke in front of the community board as it was going through the Euler process. Um, I, I said to them, you're going to see something different that night, and, and intentionally so. Um, it's right on the Grand Concourse, which is a wide street. It's a major thoroughfare in the Bronx. Um, it's, it's across and surrounded by Post Office Community College and other low-rise buildings. It's not on a block or a row of one or two family homes. Um, and so um, it's an area that could accommodate something a little larger. Um, I know the... Um, uh, the borough president uh, has expressed uh, a very positive response to having something like this, something noteworthy. Uh, I don't know if I want to use the word iconic, but something that will stand out. Um, and, um, and so that was the intent in the RFP that we issued. Um, and many of the proposals that we receive you know, were along these lines, uh, were, were similar. Um, I guess the simple answer before I turn it over to them is that uh, a bigger building has more affordable <laughs> units. And that's obviously our mission is to try to provide as many affordable units you know, as we can. Um, so yes, the, the building, the proposed building height of approximately 285 feet is just as Ted said, is to provide the maximum amount of affordable units on the site. Um, what I also want to um, say is the surrounding buildings currently don't reflect what could be built in the surrounding areas. Um, Ted mentioned the rezoning, uh, uh, that was done in 2009 would allow for higher buildings. We did not uh, conduct a study on how that could look like, but I do know that there are what, what would be considered underbuilt uh, lots in the, in the immediate vicinity. I, I, thank, I thank you for that answer, because that only leads into the next question, because if this is going to be the iconic building, because you can build up that high, doesn't mean necessarily, but do you set a new precedent for this for this part of the Bronx and this district, that if once you build high, the next developer wants to build this high, this is high, this is high, and now you've, you, you've taken a, 
piece of the Bronx that had free space, people can stretch their arms out. Now you're just building a community that's stacked on top of one another because everyone wants to build to maximum capacity. So I'm asking you as you continue to figure out how you build, let's figure out how do we don't build everything to maximum capacity to give yourself some space and some freedom, and more importantly, the people who have to live in that neighborhood, which goes to the next question. Is this educational campus that's being built or educational space, is that designed to be fed by the people in the building or is for it's entire district? It's for the community at large. Okay, for the community at large. And then my last question goes back to the community. Talking about people's, the AMI here, how do we ensure, what plans do you have ensured to make sure that residents who live in that neighborhood not only have access to this housing, but actually get into this housing? Because if you're saying the majority of the people that can't afford the housing that's around it, how are you going to put them in this new building? Because people have complained about the Bronx, about, quote, unquote, the new Port Morris that influx people from all parts of the city, and the residents who've lived there for 20, 25 years can't get into the new housing that's being developed. So if, I, if I may. So H, we, we discussed earlier with, with the chairman about how we will uh, work to do uh, affirmative marketing together to prepare <coughs> uh, CB1 and other South Bronx residents for uh, to apply. Um, HPD marketing guidelines uh, currently include a community preference. Um, right now it's 50%. And um, whatever that community preference is at the time of lease up is what will apply and that will be written into the regulatory agreement. Well, I just pray at the end of the day that everyone's happy, especially the people who lived in that neighborhood all their lives and a new building is constructed. They have opportunity to be in there and raise their families. And because we, you've heard on the, on the news recently from some landlords just messing it up. Some apartments are just with rats infested, no heat, and a new building gets erected. And I still got to live in this messed up apartment. I don't have access to a new building. So I just look forward to you all doing whatever you got to do to make sure Bronx sites have better places to live. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Solomon. Uh, Councilman if Solomon. I may just yeah. emphasize the point that about the community preference, that since the system was computerized, um, our marketing unit tells us that every single building that has gone through the process has been able to achieve the community preference threshold. Thank you, uh, Councilmember King, for some strong questions. On to Councilmember Deutsch, followed by Councilmember Diaz. Thank you, Chairs. First of all, bless you. Yeah. Um, okay, so I have uh, I have a few questions. Um, first of all, I'm looking through the um, all the details of this um, of this 27-story uh, development. I don't see anything here of what flood zone um, this building is in. Do you know what flood zone? This project site is not within a flood zone. So um, you have the the Harlem River, like right there. So how can that be part of the flood zone? Mm -hmm. So um, the site is actually located on a little bit of a ridge uh, in, in that area. So there's a significant great difference uh, down to the river. We are, um, we are multiple tens of feet uh, above the Harlem River. And during Hurricane Sandy, was this area at all flooded? I don't know. So if you don't know and you're saying it's above grade, yeah. so how do we know that it's, I mean, how do we know it's not in the flood prone area? There, there, was, there was no flooding in this immediate area. There was no flooding at all? Not in this immediate area, no. Uh-huh, okay. Um, so in addition to that, uh, I just want to say um, that this is kind of a unique building, which I, I'm looking at the architecture and everything. You have 27 stories, 277 units. And you have a school, f um, a uh, educational faculty in the same building. So would you say this is like a unique project to have a school in the same building as a high rise? Is this a model of any other buildings that you have seen in the city? It's, it's not that unusual for a charter school space. Um, there are not many examples of um, SEA DOE schools within residential buildings. But um, we've had other cases, I mean, I can only speak for the Bronx. We've had other cases, uh, not in the recent past, where developers came in with the part of their proposal being to provide space for a charter school. So um, how many children do you anticipate to, to be in the school? Um, the 
RFP um, response um, had a uh, children's population of uh, somewhat over 200 children. children. But again, um, r right now um, we haven't secured a, uh, a school operator, and that varies very much from operator to operator. Now, do we know it's if it's going to be a, uh, elementary, middle school, high school? Do you know what type of school that is lacking in this area that um, might be part of this RFP? No. Well, we've been in contact, as I mentioned earlier, with a number of operators uh, from preschool, from uh, elementary school up through high school. So the range of, of possibilities are wide open. Right now, we're trying to we're trying to uh, bring that down a little bit. Right now, in our conversations. So when you have a school in this, uh, this high-rise, how, how do you segregate the school from the residents in the building? It has a separate opening, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, it has a, a separate entrance on Walton Avenue, mm -hmm. and the internal circulation is completely separated from all other uses. So the educational facility has its own interior circulation as well as egress. There's no intermingling. Along the... Uh, on the rendering along Walton Avenue, you'll see the uh, entrance to the building, to the school component. So how far is the entrance to the school to the entrance of the building? The residential entrance is on the opposite side of the building. The lot is approximately 200 feet wide, uh, sorry, um, 160 <coughs> some feet wide. So it's on the opposite street, Grand Concourse versus Walton Avenue. And this is part of the transit district, so you have plenty of uh, public transportation around there with the kids, obviously from the school, we'll be using mass transit, we'll be going around the building. So uh, one of my concerns and when I'm looking at this is also when you have so many residents, I'm just openly talking, uh, uh, that when you have so many residents in the building and you have a school, how do we monitor, let's say, the sex offenders, any sex offenders that are in the building? Because I've not, I've not seen too many schools in the residential building. Well, I would, well, I would say that the building itself uh, has a secure, has a uh, significant amount of cameras and lighting around it, just as a matter of, uh, just as a part of the building design. And then we would also work with the operator to who is will be in control of their own space to monitor for that as well. So I, I think that's that tip, tip, typically in the lease up of a resident residential building, the the landlord will go through a background check to make sure that the tenants are able to pay, understand their credit and other background items. Uh, HPD has uh, guidelines about what you can and cannot reject people for with respect to things like um, credit history, if you have a history of homelessness, a little bit different. But um, to your question about uh, somebody with a, you know, particularly with like a recent sex offense that would come out in the, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a background check at the time of the lease up. So uh, first of all, I don't know, it, it might come out in the background track, uh, track but it's someone that moves into to, to one of these apartments, it could happen later on, so you won't see it in the background track. So I just want to make sure that I think it's important that part of the RFP, when you have a discussion with the school, that there should be some type of professionals and of authority to come in and just to uh, talk to the students and to make sure that there's extra security because cameras are good for after the fact yeah. if something happens. But I think the children, whoever, whichever school comes in here, they should be educated and also they should, um, should be monitored also by the school, part of the RFP, just to monitor if there's any sex offenders that are uh, moving into the building or are already a resident in the building and become sex offenders later on because we're talking about a lot, of, uh, a lot of residents here and you just have to keep the kids, the children safe. So I think that's important. Um, also, uh, another note, I just want to ask the panel, how did you get here today? By car, by mass transit? Just curious. Subway. <coughs> Subway. 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 Oh, do you own cars? I, I do. You do own cars. So um, <coughs> the chair asked the question about parking and so did the council member Andy King. Um, uh, the answer you gave Ted, I mean, this is not in my district, but this is something that could um, happen anywhere in the city. But parking is an issue, and I've never seen a parking lot that's underutilized um, by in, in the way that you, that you just described it, that you have a parking lot that's totally, totally empty. 
um, 277 units you have cause you know if there's some type of an incentive to tenants that if you don't have a car you'll get some type of an incentive to move into a building like this that makes sense because then you, you're bringing in people who are committed not to have vehicles but to use mass transit. But up until we have some type of incentive for them, could be a tax credit, it could be anything else, but you know, you don't know um, how many people of, out of 277 apartments and three bedrooms and, and up that may own vehicles that won't find parking nearby. And you mentioned the parking lot a quarter of a mile away. Um, I don't think anyone's gonna be uh, moving into a apartment that's affordable housing to start paying $350 a month for parking. So that's not gonna, that ain't gonna, that's not gonna happen. So, um, the, the, I mean, whenever something, a project like this goes up, I don't think an answer would be is that the parking's not being utilized, but we need to figure out in the future um, that uh, you have uh, a development of in su such a large scale that there must be some type of parking uh, for the residents. It's not a ZQA. Uh, a ZQA, I know that uh, in certain areas in the mass transit, that was waived as the MIH. So I think, um, I think you, you, there needs to be parking. Thanks for the answer, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have questions from uh, Council Member uh, Diaz Sr. We have an additional panel for uh, uh, for testimony on this matter as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I ask my question, Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask a question to you. Uh, I want to get to get in my mind clear about how we're doing this, because I see some of you guys, especially you, Mr. Chairman, you ask some ask some questions and the answer of many of them was, I will get back to you, I will get back to you. So what are the rules? Uh, the rules are, are we voting no matter what, or are we holding the vote until those questions are properly uh, satisfied? I am so glad you asked, and I am so glad to welcome you to the committee. I think that uh, the point you are making is one that has long been unspoken, which is at many hearings, we ask questions, we give the questions ahead of time, but it's always, I'll get back to you. And so I look forward to working with you and our land use chair about changing the uh, precedents. And I, for one, would be willing to stand with you on getting the answers before we vote. This item is not up for a vote today. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to work with my brothers and sisters in the Bronx on this specific matter. Thank you. Um, another question to you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, yeah. another question to you. Uh, a member of the planning board have been invited to testify today? Were well, they invited or not? Uh, so so I, I don't believe they've been invited. However, based on both of our feeling that there is a land use item here and the fact that HPD was not able to answer their questions, I think moving forward, if there is a uh, zoning action involved, we will be inviting CPC to be here as well. M Mr. Chair, if you allow me. Um, so Cou Council Member, the, uh, the community board, they sent a letter with their recommendations. No, I'm going there now. Oh, okay. Um, that's what I'm going to. Because, because, because I'm reading here that says, where was I? The community, the community board on 9-28-17, September 28, 1917, the community board vote 15 in favor, nine opposed, and one abstain. Nine and one is ten against fifteen. So, so this is not a uh, the com the board did not uh, over overwhelmingly uh, approve this. And another question is said that, uh, that the community board approved this with certain condition, and one of them said 
retain new development property manager for the project. Why, what was wrong with the first one? I'm gonna defer to the uh, chair of the, uh, the, the local member on this one, unless you wanna. So what they were referring to is the property manager. Um, wave press is an issue. So you have, you know, you have organizations that collect the rent and they're in charge of the maintenance and so Community Board 1 has issues with Wavecrest. And so I believe that their original proposal, Wavecrest was gonna be the property manager. And so they requested that Wavecrest not be the property so manager. And, oh, and we have since uh, removed uh, that management uh, company and we're in the process of identifying a new management company. The Community Board, again, is approving this based on those requirements, but that's, those requirements have not been uh, complied to with. So how are we doing? Um, on, on that matter, they are complying with it. On, on the matter of who that the management, a, on, the man, on the question of who the management company was, they complied with the community board's request to use a different management company. Yeah, one that they approved. One that the board approves? Yeah. So they, the developer has not yet identified one, and they will return to the board and, and the council member when they do. Was that great? See, I'm, I'm from, from the Bronx. I used to be representing as a senator, part of this area. And I know that my son as a borough president and, and the leaders of the community, we all want to see the Bronx being rebuilt and to see housing, we always, one thing that I am trying to always say that I would like, would like not to see, I don't, I don't like the Bronx to, to become a Harlem, and I tell you why. Harlem is beautiful now. Harlem is being renovated, beautiful, but the native are no longer there. So I'm, I'm very cautious when, when, when we do this thing because we always hear. The, ni the nice word, the nice word is affordable, affordable. But then the bottom line is affordable to whom? So when you have so many affordable houses that you say, oh, we're gonna be affordable, affordable. Affordable to whom? Can you answer that to me? Any one of you, affordable to whom? So let's go back to the AMI chart. So this is exactly who it's affordable to. People earning a range of people who are extremely low income, $20,000 a year approximately, up to people who uh, have good jobs, middle income, uh, not higher than 90, about $95,000 a year. Twenty thousand dollars for how, for what for how many their, members of the family? Their 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 annual. So the the twenty thousand dollar number is uh, for a single household, and the twenty eight thousand dollar number is for a family of four. For a single household, twenty thousand. Right. It, and that's affordable for our community. Yes, it is. Okay, I don't I don't even I don't want to answer. I don't want to ask any more questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I had some questions I had held on reserve. Uh, these, 
So with regards to the development, you've got a developer, you've got an architect, you've got general contractor, you've got management. I'd like to know for each who the owners are and how many are MWBEs. And I'd also like to know how, who the executives are and how many are MWBE. And MWBE means minority women and uh, mi minorities and women. So for, for the developers, uh, who are the developers and who are the, and who are the developers of this project and who are the owners of those development companies and uh, what is their gender? And I, I just want to make one important distinction. An MWBE is a technical term of being certified as a minority or women, uh, minority women business enterprise, which is distinct from what the racial makeup is of the executives of a firm. I just want to clarify the question. Are you asking about MWBEs and who and how many MWBEs are involved? Or are you asking about the racial makeup of the executives of the, the companies that are involved? I'm, I'm asking both. Uh, I'm not only interested in racial, I'm also interested in women. And uh, it it's so happens that uh, uh, the, the mayor has been asking nonprofits and other organizations throughout the city that don't even have any business with the city to disclose the site for the information as well. Right. So uh, I'll, I'll let uh, Thomas speak to it. I just want to mention that uh, HPD has a requirement called our Build Up Program, where 25% of HPD, uh, HPD's uh, supportable costs uh, of, of our subsidy need to be spent uh, as a goal on certified MWBEs. So that can be the contractor, it can be a painter, it can be an architect, it can be a landscape architect, but that is something that we are actively monitoring as a, a new HPD program under this administration. But I'll let Thomas answer the rest. Okay, so uh, we'll start with uh, the developer, Trinity Financial, and I'll ask uh, MBD to speak, uh, to speak on its own organization. Trinity Financial, I'll start with, is not an MWBE. But the company itself uh, has two principles: uh, one that would, one that's a minority, and one uh, that is not. So, 50% minority ownership. As far as the senior staff uh, within Trinity, I would say that that makeup is about, and again, I'm sorry, I don't have the exact uh, number, but I would say about 80% uh, either and or minority and or female. And as a company, uh, company-wide, and I think we're over now over 250 employees, we're at about 60% uh, female and or minor uh, minorities. So. And with regards to MBD Community Housing Corp? Yes, uh, MBD is a nonprofit. We employ about 30 uh, maintenance staff and nine um, administrative and social service personnel. Uh, with the administrative staff, we are about 45% uh, women. Um, and our whole uh, company, we are 98% minority. And that includes executives and owners That's and board correct. members? Well, well as, as far as executives, 100% minority. Um, we just hired uh, one gentleman who will be joining the executive staff shortly. Um, and with the uh, board, it's 100% minority. Great. And the and about fifty percent women. Great. And the architect, uh, Datner Architects. The architect is not currently an MWBE, and, and the members, uh, the ownership members, I'll have to get back to you on the exact makeup. A and uh, the information that you share with us, we can share with the public. I believe yes. And the general contractor, Manadna Contract Construction Incorporated. To my knowledge, it's also not a uh, minority or women-owned business, and I'll also have to get back to you on that with regards to the ownership makeup. And uh, the management company is to be determined yes. still? Correct. And that's in response to the community board? Correct. Yes. Uh, with regards to uh, the uh, work that's happening on, on the site, uh, my understanding is that uh, based on the uh, Local and local member and land use chairs uh, strong negotiations. There's a commitment for the service after the building is open for those folks to receive a wage rate that is commensurate with other people in the area. They will have benefits. 
they will have opportunity for training, they will have pensions and, and what have you. Yes. Uh, what, what is, uh, will that also be available for those constructing the building? The building is, uh, uh, the construction contract is for non-prevailing wage construction. Okay. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Uh, I, th I think that does. So, so they will not be receiving a prevailing wage. Will they have uh, health benefits? So if they get injured on the job or disability benefits if they become disabled on the job beyond the uh, state workers' comp? I will have to get back to you on that. Okay. Uh, just p uh, the other piece is so in terms of the facilities, uh, you will have a medical facility uh, given the fact that um, you, s you from what I understand from the local member, uh, the area does have a lot of folks at 100% of the area median income, but there are folks who are lower income in the immediate vicinity. Those folks will be on Medicare and Medicaid. Yes. Uh, will the medical facility uh, accept Medicare and Medicaid? Yes. Yes, it will. And uh, I, w I would also add that uh, we're negotiating a long-term uh, lease arrangement with the operator, so that will that will be for a long term. And with regards to the retail, it's 12,000 square feet. That's a, a lot. Is that going to be uh, another bank? Uh, I don't know if this neighborhood is highly banked, but uh, is it a bank? Is it a supermarket? Is it a chain store, a big box store? What do you? No, we're targeting a supermarket, and we're in uh, conversations with uh, with a number of supermarket operators okay and in terms of the uh, school what type of is, is it a what kind of school is it going to be uh, as I mentioned earlier we're in conversation with a number of operators so it ranging from elementary through uh, through high school and uh, so is, is it are you working with the school construction authority or the educational construction fund or Right now, we're working with uh, charter school operators. We've uh, early on in our process, in our pre-development process, we've uh, we contacted the SEA and uh, provided them with our plans uh, and uh, to get some feedback. And uh, I don't know if you want to talk about the plans that we had uh, developed in conjunction with the partner. We went into the or we submitted as an RFP response, which was a a charter high school, um, the plans uh, did not suffice um, SCA's requirements. Uh, so um, I think just for HPD, so in the community board resolution, they indicated that uh, advanced discussions with SCA to ensure school seat capacity is met with projects in the district to reduce school seat deficits in community board. One, uh, I, I guess, is are those is that happening? I'm sorry, can you read the passage again? Uh, it's it's from the handout that's publicly available. Oh, it's yeah. that's not uh, it's an internal briefing. We are going to make so much available to the public on these moving forward. It's yeah, not even funny. <laughs> so um, this is something that uh, Council Member Diaz Senior uh, was referencing, and I'm glad he called our attention to. And this is the community board's resolution. And so he had focused on the properly manager. The and so the community board resolution uh, reads, uh, in association with future EIS of HPD projects, advanced discussions with school construction authority to ensure school seat the cap capacity is met with projects in the district to reduce school seat deficits in Bronx Community Board 1. And that is publicly available. We uh, work with our partners over at SEA and with City Hall on that. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of items where you said I get uh, will that you will get back to us. Uh, it is my belief, as well as the belief of uh, Council Member Diaz Senior, who I applaud for really standing up on that, and I hope he will continue to do so. It will be good to have a number of folks saying to the city agencies that we need to come to these hearings with all the answers and uh, we, we look forward to having those answers. Uh, this is the initial hearing. We will continue to add to the record. 
uh, and uh, we will work with the local member and land use chair as we head towards a vote. Uh, we have, and I'd like to excuse this panel, but we will send additional questions to you and just ask that uh, the additional materials are provided under the same terms as where you are today, which is that uh, under your affirmation uh, that it will be tr accurate, tr truthful and accurate. Thank you, I'll excuse this panel. We have uh, a second panel, uh, Bryant Brown, uh, who represents 32BJ, SEIU, and uh, William Woodruff uh, of UFT, the United Federation of Teachers. Who'd ever like to go first? And uh, if you can keep uh, your remarks sh shorter, uh, if 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 you exceed a certain number of minutes, we're going to aim for two to three minutes. But uh, uh, we'll we'll we'll, s we'll s I, j I tend to do five. So so let, let's start with five, and you don't have to use all five. Excellent. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Bryant Brown, and I am here speaking on behalf of 32BJ SEIU. 32BJ is the largest property service union in the country, representing 85,000 service workers across the city and 163,000 nationwide. 32BJ members maintain, clean, and provide security services in schools, commercial and residential, both market rate and affordable, buildings all across the five boroughs including at projects like 425 Grand Concourse. 32BJ SEIU supports responsible developers who are committed to supporting working families. Our union has had very productive conversations with the development team, and we hope to continue working with the community and with the applicants to ensure that this project provides good building service jobs for New Yorkers. We would also like to thank uh, Chair Kalos, as well as Councilmember Salamanca for his support. Uh, good jobs can help Bronx residents out of poverty and allow workers at the site to support their families and continue to call New York home. Thank you. Thank you for only using 45 seconds. Hello, my name is uh, Bill Woodruff. I come representing the United Federation of Teachers. Uh, I work with Councilman Salamanca, so he knows keeping it short is not my strong suit, so I will try my best. Um, I come also not just as the district rep for District 7 who would look at this and a member of the district leadership committee, um, but also as a teacher at PS31. And so I feel like I need to correct the record when they said that PS31 was closed. The building was condemned, but PS31 is still here. I taught there this morning. The community is still there. And in fact, for the 14 years that I've worked in this community, the children have come from that neighborhood and crossed the Grand Concourse. And if you've ever been there in the mornings when it's rush hour, they've made that dangerous commute because they love PS31. So we're taking something from the community and we're building something. And I've also been there for 14 years. And when I was moving to the Bronx recently, personally, I was priced out of the Bronx. Out of the, the lower part of, of District 7. So I understand the need for affordable housing, and I understand that I had to move to a different part of the Bronx because I was priced out personally. Um, so I understand both sides of the situation, and I, I truly love that we're putting affordable housing. I don't understand why these children and these families, who for the last almost 20 years, have been crossing the Grand Concourse to continue at PS31 when their school was displaced 
are continuing to be displaced because we're only working with charter operators. It's been my experience that charter operators do not work to maintain the same level of quality. And in fact, in New York State, they've gone to the Board of Ed to say, the, the State Department of Ed, to ask to not have the same level of teacher credentials recently. And now we're going on the record saying that this new educational facility, one of the reasons they aren't working with SCA is because it doesn't meet the school construction authority requirements. That concerns me. Because for 14 years, I've gotten up early every day, sometimes being at my school at 5 AM, because I care about this community. We've looked at these issues across the country. We've looked at, at these issues, how they've hurt our public schools. And I can tell you that this year alone, out of the 23 elementary and middle schools in my district, I do not cover high schools, I took four of those because there are class size issues and that the public schools don't have enough seats. The charter schools, plenty of seats because they're pushing their kids out and they're ending up back in the public schools. But yet there's not a conversation to move that displaced school back to their traditional home. There's not a conversation to put a public school back into the community and there's no public school right in that area. Those families are walking a long distance in order to go to a public school. As a Bronxite, because now I'm, I'm proud to live in the Bronx and I'm, I'm happy to be here, and, and I don't see myself going anywhere for a very long time because I do love the Bronx, I want my tax dollars accounted for. And charter schools don't have that tax accountability as well. So I have a lot of concerns when it comes to the educational quality that the children in the neighborhood that I love deserve. And so I, I ask that there be a consideration to put a public school, a public elementary school, knowing that we don't have enough seats for our children in public elementary schools in District 7. Thank you. Uh, you currently teach at PS 31? Correct. I'm the uh, district rep, and I also currently teach at, at 31. So, so district rep is a split position in that I do represent the UFT's interests across the district, but I do have teaching responsibilities at my home school is PS 31. Currently, I teach uh, fourth grade in Richmond. Thank you for uh, taking time to be here today. Thank you also for living and working to in the same community. I think our city would be much better off if our folks did that. Uh, how how many folks how many kids do you teach in your class is your class overcrowded or is your school I teach an enrichment pullout uh, my class does right now we we don't have enough teachers so there is a couple periods a week where we have what are called mass preps where the children are placed into large rooms um, and there uh, when I can well PS 31 did not have oversized classes I do represent all of the elementary and middle schools and so I can speak to um, four of my schools were found to have oversized classes uh, throughout the district, including another elementary school. Um, and th there is the need for, for public school seats. I'd like to uh, call on Councilmember Ruben Diaz, Sr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, just to say that I used to take my son, the one who's board of president now, Ruben Diaz, Jr., to, to PS 30, 31. Sorry to interrupt, Kong. but his picture does hang in our school because we're, we're proud to have him yeah. as an alumni of 31, and he, he's a great man. So he did a great I, job. I know what, what you're talking about. Um, definitely, we need to build more public school. However, charter school was a creation of out of a, a disparate call for our black and Hispanic children to be to get a good education and to get a chance to educate. Charter school have been proven to be good for black and Hispanic children. Charter school have been built in black and Hispanic community, northern white community. Majority. So about 90, 95 percent of charter school students are black and Hispanic. Right now, there is a waiting list of more than 60,000 ch ch children waiting in our community, in black and Hispanic community. To, to, so those parents are dying 
to get an ch- opportunity for their children to go into public, into charter school. So yes, we need to build more public uh, school. Ho- however, charter school have been a godsend for our black and Hispanic community. I will always support charter school, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that they are counting on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'd like to excuse this panel. And uh, are there any more members of the public who wish to testify? Seeing none, uh, we will uh, close our our physical public hearing uh, pending uh, responses from the developer and HPD on the outstanding questions. Uh, We'd like to get those documents within 72 hours. Uh, if we don't receive it by then, we will continue to hold it open we until those documents are, are in. We are closing the public hearing. We are accepting the written responses in 72 hours. Uh, if we don't receive it within 72 hours, I will be forced to read it into the record, which is not my preference. Uh, so, so thank you. Today's second hearing is on land use item number 11, the 9 Fort Washington Avenue cluster UDAP and tax exemption application for properties located in Councilmember Levine's district in Manhattan. The properties are 9 Fort Washington Avenue, 518 West 161st Street, 544 46 West 163rd Street, and 609 West 158th Street. HPD seeks approval from the Urban Development Action Area Project UDAP designation, disposition, and project approval pursuant to Article 16 of general municipal law as well as approved approval of a 40-year real property tax exemption pursuant to Article 11, Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law. These actions will facilitate the rehabilitation and disposition of four city-owned occupied residential buildings totaling 94 units to the existing tenants. And I'm going to start that over in English. Uh, There's a bunch of buildings. Uh, The city ended up getting them way back when. Uh, They were part of a program called TIL, where residents were given buildings uh, to to own and operate. We're taking those buildings, which never really made it into the hands of the tenants, and we're going to try to give it to them under a different program uh, through an HDFC program. And uh, uh, in addition to try to make sure that it's affordable, uh, we're also going to offer them a tax abatement for the buildings so that uh, they can do the work that's necessary to maintain them and afford it. And uh, there's other actions that we'll be taking. Uh, So I'd like to open up the public hearing on land use item 11, the 9 Fort Washington Avenue cluster UDAP and tax exemption application. And with that, I'd like to uh, call up Jordan Press of HPD. Christy O'Connell of HPD, as well as S. This is my version. Now I got it. Uh, Esmeen uh, Spellwitz of uh, Mutual Housing Association of New York, affectionately referred to as uh, Manny, and who was referenced during the previous hearing. Uh, and uh, with that, I'll ask all three folks to state your names, and then I will uh, seek your affirmation. Jordan Press. Christine Ratzlaff O'Connell. He's Mimi Spiliotis. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee in response and in response to all council member questions? I do. Yes, I do. Thank you. You may now begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Land use number 11 consists of a, the proposed disposition of four partially occupied city owned properties located at 9 Fort Washington Avenue, 518 West 161st Street. 544 to 46 West 163rd Street and 609 West 158th Street in Manhattan Council District 7 and is known as the Fort Washington Avenue ANCP cluster. HPD's Affordable Neighborhood Cooperative Program, or ANCP, selects qualified developers to rehabilitate distressed city-owned occupied multifamily properties managed by the Tenant Interim Lease Program in order to create affordable cooperatives for low and moderate income households. All ANCP properties are currently owned by the City of New York. They will be transferred to Restoring Communities HDFC upon construction loan closing and conveyed to a newly formed cooperative HDFC upon conversion. 
Restoring communities will hold title and oversee the rehabilitation and cooperative conversion that will be undertaken by the developer, Manny, selected through our request for qualifications. The developer will sign a site development and management agreement with restoring communities that will be in effect until co-op conversion occurs and title will be transferred to the individual cooperative and its shareholders. From cooperative conversion, the developer will remain the property manager for at least one year. After the first year, the co-op will have the choice of keeping the developer as property manager or hiring a new company that must be approved by HPD. The Fort Washington AMCP cluster has a total of 94 units that include a mixture of unit types. There are six one-bedrooms, 40 two-bedrooms, and 48 three-bedroom apartments. Existing occupants will be able to purchase their unit for $2,500, and the initial maintenance is anticipated to be set at 40% of the area median income, or approximately $730 for a one-bedroom unit, $886 for a two-bedroom unit, $1,019 for a three-bedroom apartment. Household AMI targets for vacant apartments are between 100 and 125 percent. The buildings will undergo substantial rehabilitation to reconfigure the existing railroad designs as they are no longer compliant with DOB code. The work will include structural joist replacement, asbestos and lead removal, as well as work to the building envelopes such as masonry, new windows, and new roofs. Additionally, the rehab will include replacement of building systems such as electrical and plumbing and installation of a new boiler. The apartment interiors will, will include new bathrooms and kitchen fixtures, meeting green initiative standards, entry doors, new flooring, hallway upgrade, and lighting. Post-construction, the unit mix will be eight one-bedrooms, 54 two-bedrooms. Um, I'm sorry. And 32. And 32 three-bedrooms. There will be a two-phase relocation and construction schedule where two buildings will be rehabbed at the same time. All existing tenants are aware of the relocation timeline for the buildings. In addition to seeking disposition approval, Land Use Number 11 seeks Article 11 tax benefits in order to help the HDFC maintain affordability. The term of the tax exemption will be for 40 years coinciding with the regulatory agreement. Council Member Levine has been briefed and supports approval of the process, of the project. Thank you. Um, and let me just invite uh, uh, Ismini as representative of the developer to just introduce uh, Manny to the committee as the sponsor of the project. Just give a brief background of the organization. Thank you, B um, Jordan. Thank you, council f people. Um, I'm Ismini. I'm the executive, executive director of Manny, a nonprofit housing and community development organization that um, uh, owns and manages over 1,500 apartments throughout the city, all um, affordable to uh, very low and low income people, families. Uh, we were selected through uh, the RFQ process um, that Jordan referred to, and uh, we actually have an expertise in um, working with rehabbing buildings with people either in occupancy or relocating people temporarily out of their buildings and then bringing them back. Uh, and so I think that's why we were selected. And we've been working with the residents of these four buildings for over the last 12 months um, to make sure that they are aware of the entire process and supportive of what is basically happening to, to them and making sure that they're participating in it. We're going to try to do a quick hearing and we're going to have some of the members come back to uh, vote. I want to just take a moment to thank uh, Councilmember Diaz Sr. for uh, being here and asking tough questions. Uh, it's actually more frequent than not that you see just one member remaining. It is rare for members to uh, attend the whole hearing, which is uh, really appreciated. So thank you. So first question, so we've got these apartments people have been living in, uh, how much will they be paying to stay in their apartments? So the, the maintenance uh, is going to be set at approximately 40% of area median income, and 40% of AMI uh, is what's shown to be able to cover monthly operating costs, save a little bit for the future, so if there's some capital repair or operating need, they can, they can cover those costs. Um, as well as pay a small amount of debt service to a, uh, a permanent mortgage. 
And, and how much does that work out to in dollars and cents? Sure. So a, a one bedroom is approximately seven thirty, uh, two bedroom is eight eighty six, and a three is one thousand nineteen. And uh, tenants who are living there currently are paying twenty five hundred dollars uh, a month. Sorry, twenty five hundred to buy the apartment. That's correct. So the purchase price for the existing families is 2500 There's also what we call the unit purchase savings plan, which we rolled out last year, which is a rent-to-own model. So that families that earn 80% of AMI or less would be eligible to put their rent, their rent paid during construction into a savings account up to $2,250. And uh, if somebody can't afford that, uh, it, what, what are the, sorry, what are the incomes of the people who live in the building currently sure. uh, from minimum to maximum? Sure. So, so we have uh, requested income surveys from all uh, existing families. Uh, the data is currently self-reported. Um, it hasn't been um, evaluated as of yet. Um, so we have anywhere from 3% of AMI, which is a self-reported income of $2,500 a month, all the way up to 107% of area median income, which is closer to uh, approximately $100,000 a year. Um, once we go through the process, and, and, and this may be your next question, of uh, facilitating Section 8 applications, there is going to be uh, an actual collection of, d of data documentation to affirm resident incomes. And w once that happens, if somebody can't afford it, will they have other finance? Will they will they have any support to stay in their unit? Yes. So we anticipate that existing families will be offered Section Eight applications at the time that the rent restructure is anticipated to occur, which is after construction. Um, and there is a process in place to work with residents to ensure that they fill out the applications correctly and that they're getting support to get through the process and get their voucher. I thought Section 8 isn't available anymore. Folks are always asking for Section 8. So how, how there's is two this? Good question. So how, how is this possible and uh, who's paying for it? So there's two pools of Section 8 in the city of New York. There's a Section 8 that is administered through NYCHA, which is citywide and it's public. And then there's HPD Section 8. So our Section 8 is only used for HPD projects. Uh, we must initiate some kind of rent restructure or identify a rent burden for a project that's going through HPD in order to use our Section 8. It is not public use. Uh, and so how many of the units in this new development group, this cluster, are it, for folks watching at home, we're talking about new co-ops that people can buy for $2,500. Uh, it can, can I or, or can somebody watching at home get one of these units for $2,500? No. So there are vacancies. This cluster is approximately 67% occupied. Um, so there, there are vacancies within the four individual buildings. Um, the sale prices for the vacant apartments is going to be higher than the insider price. Insiders have uh, sweat equity in these buildings. They have been tenant associations since their entrance into the TIL program in the early 2000s, and so their their um, their value is that they get to purchase in at 2,500, subject to the unit purchase savings program. Um, outsiders will have sale prices that are higher, and and those sale prices help come in and pay down construction costs for the project. Uh, okay, so so maybe it's a qualified no. So I'm watching at home, and uh, there's these. Units, how many units are we talking about? And can anyone do it, or is there an income restriction? Yes. And what is the, the likely uh, ballpark for how much these, these co-ops are? Sure. So um, we're currently looking at 31 vacant apartments across the portfolio. Uh, that will be marketed through HPD uh, full lottery process. Um, so there are certain... Um, Preferences that are allotted, as we spoke about in the last program, a community preference. There's also going to be some units that are um, ADA compliant, and so there'll be some preferences for that. Um, it's a it's a full lottery, so it's uh, it's not first come first serve. Um, the apartments are approximately um, three hundred fifty thousand dollars for a two bedroom. That's our current estimate. Um, we're still finalizing the numbers. We think we're pretty close, but as Jordan has mentioned previously, sometimes as, as we get closer to closing, we want to really get them set in stone. So right now we're approximately 350 for a two-bedroom. 
um, the income restriction for for that price unit is going to be somewhere between 110 percent of, of area median income and 120 percent of area median income. And, and for those who may not be familiar with the AMIs, what income is 110 to 120? Sure. Um, I've got my little my little notes here. So um, let's look at a two bedroom. Um, for, for two individuals, because these are right-sized units, so they, a one-bedroom can, can be sold to a family of one, but a two-bedroom must be sold to a family of two. Um, so uh, approximately 110% of AMI is $84,000 a year. 120 is approximately $91,000 a year. Great. So there'll be a range. But uh, I guess some folks watching at home might be like, a person's buying it for twenty five hundred. Now they can sell it for three hundred and fifty thousand. Why does that person uh, get to make uh, more than a quarter million dollars? Is there anything to disincentivize somebody from flipping their apartment and just walking, leaving our city, and and uh, just making money? Absolutely. So there are a number of protective restrictions that these co-ops will have to adhere to through our regulatory agreement with the city of New York with HPD. Um, one of those restrictions is the flip tax requirement. Um, so for an insider purchasing their apartment at $2,500, um, they will have to flip a certain percentage of the sale profit uh, back to the co-op. Sale profit is considered anything over the original purchase price and any closing costs. So, so no one participating would lose out on the value they put into the project or into their home ownership, um, but they would have to flip a certain amount back to the co-op. Uh, how much is the flip tax going to be and for how long? Sure. So there's there's a little bit of differentiation between an existing tenant's flip tax and a flip tax for the vacant apartments. Um, for an insider, they must, uh, within year one, flip back 95% of their sale profit to the co-op. Uh, that's um, pretty much everything. That's pretty much everything in year one. And it goes up, the, the amount that the, the seller is able to retain goes up every year until year 15, and at year 15, they can retain 80% of the sale profit, and they are required to flip back 20% to the co-op. So over time, there's definitely value that's um, you know realized. And, and how long, so, so it's only a 20% flip tax at year 15? At year 15, and then that goes through the, the end of the regulatory term. Okay, so one, one fifth of any additional income, and so how long is the regulatory term? This regulatory agreement we're proposing is for 40 years. Okay, uh, and so as I did with the previous project, uh, what are some of the subsidies? So is there a uh, tax abatement? And w how long, what is the annual tax abatement, and what is the total uh, for all years? Sure. So there, we are requesting an Article 11 tax exemption because this will be an HDFC co-op entity. All, there'll be four co-op entities. Um, the, the term is 40 years, um, and the net present value of the four exemptions is $4.4 .4 million. Um, the cumulative value is $15.8 million. Okay. So th those are pretty, pretty low tax. Uh, that's a pretty low tax subsidy. Uh, are there any other tax-related subsidies? There are no other tax-related subsidies. Are there any financing subsidies, as we saw on a different project? Absolutely. So um, HPD is committed to investing in the rehabilitation of these properties so that they're safe and habitable, and they'll last another 100 years after they're conveyed to the co-op. We do invest, um, per our term sheet, up to $200,000 per unit to rehab the, the building. Um, we are investing uh, approximately uh, $138,000 per unit in for the co-op conversion. So and maybe I can give you just a little bit of information about that further. Um, so HPD, every time we do one of these projects, tenants are required to meet certain requirements in order to convert to co-op. Um, Tenants are required to go to training classes. They have eight core classes they have to attend. They're required to pay rent regularly, and also 80% of the total building must be in contract in order to convert to co-op, which is a, a New York State Attorney General requirement. Um, if we're not able to get to those three thresholds on any one of these four buildings, one of those buildings may become a rental instead. 
Um, and so HPD needs to project what the cost of rehabilitating a building is if it doesn't have the sale proceeds income. Um, in that case, HPD would have to invest a certain additional amount of subsidy to, to be able to convert the co-op, uh, excuse me, to be able to convert the building um, into uh, you know, a rental property, a rent stabilized property. So uh, help me with this. The buildings are already there. People are living there. How much work are we really talking about? Ms. Mini, do you want to talk that? I'll take that one. So the buildings are in um, pretty bad condition. So uh, after we did the assessment of the buildings, we made a determination that the most cost-effective long-term plan was to actually do a substantial rehab of each building, which means everything. So, so, so what does that mean, and how much is that going to cost? And is that like you're, you're just taking it down to the walls and the beams, or are you just going in and, like, changing the paint? So we are actually, um, we actually need to relocate the residents from their current homes into temporary relocation, and then we are going to gut the inside of the building completely down to the studs so that, uh, in fact, the, um, any, uh, any floor joists that need replacing or doubling up will happen. Um, the brick walls will remain, but pretty much everything else from roof to cellar will be brand new in each building. And the cost of that right now is, um, where is my construction number? Yeah, I think it's about three hundred um, thirty thousand dollars uh, per unit to rehab these buildings. Three hundred and thirty thousand dollars per apartment. Okay, so all in, how how many million would you say? Uh, we're approximately we're around thirty million dollars for the whole project. Okay, and so the money's so so in, so in terms of the financing. What, what type of financing are, are you looking at? So the financing is actually under, um, it's, a, it's a participation loan program where um, we actually go out and look for a private lender. Uh, in this case, we've approached the Community Preservation Corporation. Sorry. That's okay. Um, the Community Preservation Corporation, CPC, is gonna be the participatory lender <coughs> with um, HPD. To so CPC will provide the first mortgage, private financing, mm -hmm. and that's um, sized based on what uh, we can afford to amortize. That loan will actually be a uh, fully amortized um, during the regulatory period. And then the second mortgage will be the HPD subsidy. Um, there's a very, very small, the $2,500 times the 94 units is the equity that the buildings will be bringing to the project. Um, and then the sales proceeds come out to almost $12 million currently at that 110 to 120. Um, and so that what happens there is then there's a construction loan that's much bigger. And then as the sales sell, then we actually pay down both the HPD and the private mortgage to the number that can be actually um, maintained with the rents and the maintenance that we're going to be charging going forward. Are, are you receiving any financing from HDC or state or federal uh, funding or incentives? So the only other additional financing that we'll be getting is a grant from the S New York State Affordable Housing Corporation that's actually only available if the applicants, which in this case they are, are income eligible for that subsidy. Uh, the area median income uh, is for folks who are at 110 to 120 uh, percent uh, of the area median income, but that's a citywide measure. Uh, in, in, in anyone's estimation at the table, do we know what the uh, area median income is for the community board or the zip code? Yeah. In 2015, the median household income uh, for Manhattan Community Board 12 was $45,800. Uh, so, so that would be almost half of uh, the city. This, the, the, I think it's even, it's regional, not even city. It's that's right. So that's, that's half. So I guess um, one question I have is, so why in a neighborhood where folks are so low income, why are we building, how is it, wh why are the terms of this uh, project 
uh, for people who are going to come in earning more, and some might be concerned it might actually have a, a gentrifying effect. Sure. So um, when when we embark on this rehabilitation project, it is with the uh, the primary focus being on returning the uh, the residents who currently live there into um, a quality uh, quality home. These are very expensive rehabs uh, to to undertake, and and we want a good product, and we want the uh, building to be on on good financial grounds uh, when the project's complete. One of the ways that we accomplish that uh, is by the the increased subsidy that that Christine mentioned, and the other way that we accomplish that uh, is by effectively cross subsidizing the project with the sale of vacant units at, uh, at higher AMIs, but at AMIs that are still uh, below, um, well below the market. I, I may pause my questioning as soon as we achieve quorum, and I may interrupt you in the middle of an answer, and we will take the vote and continue, but just, uh, we're doing a lot of subsidies. Why can't we just do more so that we can make it more affordable uh, for local residents? So the subsidy levels are, um, the city subsidy levels are uh, the highest uh, in our ANCP program across all of our programs. Um, and that would be my answer. Uh, I'm going to interrupt our, our question and answer just to see if there is any other member of the public who wishes to testify. Seeing none, uh, I will ask. Uh, fair enough. So we will uh, pass on some questions in writing, uh, specifically relating to MWBE, as well as uh, whether or not this project is being done uh, by workers who are both doing the construction work and the service work at a wage rate that is commensurate, that the folks are receiving training, that there's a local hire, and that the uh, folks have benefits uh, and retirement and health and uh, disability. So uh, we will pass those questions on and we hope to have that entered into the record. Uh, in the interest of time and, and actually voting on this uh, today, I just wanna thank you. You, you. you shared those answers with me, some of them I've been Happy with others, I, I haven't, but we'll enter it into the public record uh, for those who, who wish to watch, and you'll be able to go to council.nyc.gov to pull those written responses uh, that we will be sharing. Uh, and seeing that there isn't anyone from the public, and in the interest of time, I will now uh, close the public hearing on land use item 11. And, uh, and seeing no questions or remarks from members of the subcommittee, I'll now call on a vote to approve land use item 11, the Fort Washington Avenue cluster, which has support of council member Levine, the local member, uh, and uh, the 425 Grand Concourse application will be laid over. Council, please call the roll. Vote to approve land use item 11, Chair Kalos. Aye. Deutsch. Aye. Diaz. By a vote of three in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions, the item is recommended for approval and referred to the full land use committee. Uh, and we will uh, leave the uh, vote open, and uh, thank you to this uh, panel. Thank you. Thank you. Let me know when you're ready. Okay. Ready? Are we back on? Okay. Gibson? I vote aye. The um, revised vote is four in the affirmative, zero neg negative, and zero abstentions. Open.
King. Vote aye. By a vote of five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions, the land use items are approved and referred to the full land use committee. You can gavel up. Hereby adjourn this uh, first hearing of the uh, subcommittee on uh, planning, con uh, dispositions, and concessions. <laughs>